Hey everybody, welcome back to One Club Shorts Podcast. Uh, look, I'd love to tell you we've got a ton of golf stuff to talk about, but we really don't. I mean, it, it's kind of in that weird time frame of right before the Ryder Cup, end of the season for um, the FedEx Cup. Not a lot of not a lot of stuff going on. Luckily, luckily for us, we are in the thralls of uh, some great college football and some amazing uh, NFL football. It was a horrible, horrible week for some of us New Yorkers all around. Um, actually, almost all the New Yorkers, except for the Jets, squeezing out a win. But um, even with that being said, it's still, to me, one of my favorite things to talk about week one of uh, NFL. We're back, and it's uh, – it's crazier than ever. There's so much going on. The hopes have been crashed. New hopes have been risen. It's like everything that you thought would happen in the preseason either is slowly crashing and burning and, and do you get in panic mode or you just say, hey, it's week one, we'll figure it out. So, well, I have a feeling I know where you're going to want to start, um, but I'll let you kick it off with an official question and then we'll just, uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, Craig, where I want to start is I just want to know if you have any comments on Notre Dame going to Raleigh, North Carolina, playing a defense that had not allowed 45 points at home in over four years and putting up 45 on a power five opponent, um, you know, just in week two of the season. In fact, putting up more points against that opponent than Michigan has in either of their games this year. I know, you know, there's been a lot of talk out of you about this not being a legit team for the Irish. I just, I want to know if, you know, them going and dominating a power five opponent with a very good quarterback and a, a really feared defense is, is changing that at all for you. No. Didn't think so. Um, <laughs> and we'll follow Wait, up. I got a question for you, Will. Yeah. Um, so a lot of trash being talked about the Notre Dame quarterback. And probably well deserved. The, the kid looks like an absolute stud. He does. Where do you compare him now that you've seen a couple weeks? And I, I know it's early. We'll see how he does against Ohio State. Um, but if you were going to rank top five quarterbacks this year, um, that that want, that would be NFL ready. Let me rephrase that. Top oh, five okay. quarterbacks that would be NFL ready at the end of this season. Where do you rank them? So the thing with Hartman is. Like there was, there was the whole narrative that the slow mesh offense at Wake Forest is gimmicky and he needed to get to a more pro style offense to show that he's NFL ready. So I think the question with him is if you think he's going to perform this way at, you know, over, over the rest of the season in a pro style offense and you ignore how old he is, that's like all awesome for his draft stock. Like he's shown that he can excel in an NFL offense. I think... You know, the performance against Wake for uh, against NC State was really good, but like I think it would take something extraordinary for me to say that like I'd put him ahead of Caleb Williams. I, I wouldn't. Like I think Drew Aller from Penn State is incredible. I think people are gonna be talking about him a lot over the rest of this year. Um, but if you look at the places where we're accustomed to seeing quarterbacks, you know, particularly Ohio State, like Notre Dame is going to go into that game with an advantage at quarterback, which normally doesn't happen. Alabama has a tough quarterback situation. I think we're still figuring out what Quinn Ewers is at Texas. So, like, ignoring all the things that go into the NFL draft, particularly his age, I think there aren't that many quarterbacks you would want starting for your team over Sam Hartman. Like, Caleb Williams might be the only obvious one. But when you get into a conversation about like draft stock or readiness to excel in the NFL, like I think the two knocks on him are he's 24 years old and people don't use high picks on 24 year olds. And second, he's been playing in a pro style offense for three games. He's done it really well, but it's three games. I think Caleb Williams is by far right now, just head and shoulders. This, his sidearm passes, his, the way he moves around in the pocket, his confidence now having a, a second year in this in that same system at USC. He is by far the tier one top pick of the draft. Easily. After that, I think it starts to get a little um, a little questionable, right? Like, is J.J. McCarthy totally legit, or is he more like a, a Zach Wilson? Is he not big? Like, he's got a gun for an arm. 
and he seems to make a lot of plays, but you know, again, he hasn't really been challenged a ton and, you know, and, and in the big games, he hasn't always, you know, been as pristine as you'd want him to be, but the kid's legit athlete. And, you know, we'll see at the end of the year, if, you know, how we really, how that all really plays out. Um, I just, it, it was interesting because I was looking at all these different quarterbacks and I'm just like, man, I'm not really excited about any of them except for Caleb Williams at this point. And it's, I know it's early, but. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, Aller from Penn state's exciting. People are excited about Jordan Travis at Florida state. Um, it's hard. Actually, to, yeah. He does look much better than I thought he would. Yeah. It's hard to ignore what Shudder Sanders is doing at Colorado. Obviously I think you can ask questions about the quality of opponents they've seen, but you can do that for a lot of teams. It's only been a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, you look around to the places where you expect to see dudes at quarterback. You look at Alabama, you look at Ohio State, you look at Clemson, uh, and you're not really seeing that. And honestly, like a lot of people are really big into Drake May at North Carolina. And look, man, you should not need two overtimes to beat Appalachian State at home. And you should not only put up 27 points in regulation against them. Like, I mean, I, he's not that big. I mean, he's not, he's not that big. People are, big for Mayfield. yeah, people are really excited about him, but, and like, I, I got a lot of crap from my friends for saying that last year's game against Notre Dame showed me that Drake may wasn't good because UNC's defense lost that game. And oftentimes when he has lost games, his defense has lost them. But like, you look at the second half, he played against Georgia tech at home in a loss last year, abysmal. You look at the performance he put up against App State, really bad. Like, I think this year is going to show us a couple interesting things about Drake May. First, if UNC's defense is a little bit better, which I think the games against South Carolina and App State suggest it might be, is he, like, theoretically, if he's as good as they should, he should be, people say he is, they should never lose. Like, they don't play a very hard schedule, and they have a defense, and they have this quarterback who's supposed to be phenomenal, why should they ever lose? So that's one thing. And then I think the other is like, what's been going on where he's losing winnable games? I, I think that's like a huge red flag for me with good college quarterbacks. Like the best ones do not lose winnable games. And Drake May is starting to have a reputation of making those games really interesting or not winning them. And like... I am lower on him than a lot of people, but yeah, I'm, I'm on like Drake may red flag watch. Yeah. I think he's, he's definitely a stock drop from, from where, if where they thought he'd be at the end of last year to where he is now, and that doesn't mean he can't rebound. He's got, again, they have a lot of season left. Um, but I think it doesn't take many red flags. If, if you're going to be a first round quarterback, you almost have to be so perfect Yeah, or such a high ceiling you know, like, a like, um, you know, athletically where it's like, man, yeah. I, they may be a little loosey goosey with the ball. They may not be have a ton of experience, but Holy cow, they dominated, you know, every athletic challenge we put in front of them. We'll turn them into a good pro, you know, yeah. like, exactly. we'll figure it out. Um, and then Drake may is of course at risk of his old OC is at Wisconsin now. So, yeah. Anyone who wants to say Drake May is a system quarterback is going to have a little bit of ammo to do it. And that's not good for the narratives. Yeah. But we can move off of college football because week one time in the NFL, Buffalo. What'd you say? Time to talk Buffalo. It <sighs> is. It is time to talk Buffalo. So, Glenn, mm -hmm. you called this game out as the game that whichever fan base lost would certainly overreact to. And man, is there a lot to overreact to. <laughs> so the, the Jets and Bills play on Monday night. Aaron Rodgers lasts four snaps, effectively ending the Jets season for all non-Zach Wilson believers. <laughs> And yet the Bills still find a way to lose the game. Give me your assessment of just what went on in that mess on Monday night. <laughs> well, it's the first NFL football game that ended with two losers. I think in the exactly. history of football. <laughs> so my prediction came is somewhat half true. Bills fans are really down on Josh as they should be. And look, 
he took he took the blame. He put it on his shoulders because he absolutely had to. He made three horrific throws and fumbled a couple times. Thankfully, only lost one. Um, I just don't I don't know where his head is. But you know what makes Josh great is that confidence he has in himself to make the impossible throw. Mm-hmm. And that also puts him in a position where he's going to have games like this. You know, Peyton Manning. I remember as great as Peyton Manning was, he would have two or three dog games every season where the ball was just fluttering and he'd throw a bunch of picks. Yep. Um, so I'm not, I'm not on the, Oh no, it's over. I mean, he still had a better, after all of that, he had a better passer rating than, uh, than Joe Burrow. <laughs> <It's just laughs> yeah, Joe game. Burrow. We're going <laughs> to get to that. Just set the bar. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> that's where I'm setting it. <laughs> the, the highest played paid player in football history. And Josh Allen had his worst game as a bill since his rookie's year. And, he still had a better QBR. I'm, I'm not hitting panic mode. I know Bill's mafia is hitting panic mode. Uh, there's too much talent. They're currently healthy. And uh, that's the, the the only two things you need to, to win in this league. So, I mean, are you the, the buzz that I'm hearing? The, maybe, maybe it's not buzz. Maybe it's still whispers at this point. But what I'm hearing people say is Josh Allen actually is not good without Brian Dable. And... He does have the most interceptions in the NFL in the last 18 regular season games. He has not had a whole ton of playoff success. I know some of that rests on a coin flip, uh, which may still be a sore spot. But like, what do you, I I think last year we talked a good amount about Josh Allen's decision-making, Josh Allen's propensity to turn the ball over in high leverage spots. And the fact that, this offense led by ostensibly one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL put up what 13 points, 16 points, 16, 16 on the jets. Mm-hmm. Like, are <laughs> any, any alarm bells for you with Josh Allen? Or is this still uh, a situation where look, he's so talented. He's going to win you more games than he loses you, et cetera. If you would have asked me Monday night, I would have said, ah, season's over, but Don and I rewatched the game last night. It wasn't as bad as I think everyone's saying it's, it's not time to throw in the towel. It's not, um, I think what Dable gave Josh that Dorsey doesn't is a calming voice. Dorsey is a hothead, crazy, mm-hmm. you know, slamming the uh, iPad down. Josh needs someone in his ear that's going to calm him down. You know, every every week, I don't know if the teams you follow do this, sometimes they'll play, oh, this is what the player is listening to music before the game. And usually it's like, you know, uh, hardcore rap, hip hop, you know, um, heavy metal. Josh listens to like Frank Sinatra <laughs> and Mel Torme. And so he has a sort of smoothness in his head. So I think he's very aware of how scattered he is and how and how overconfident he can be. And I think he does everything to calm himself in those big moments. I just think, I don't think Ken Dorsey is a good fit for a young quarterback, a young offensive coordinator, not a good fit for a really young raw court he's still raw he's got he still has a ceiling that he hasn't hit yet josh allen given his talents um i think we just need a more mature uh and more creative offensive play calling and someone just to get in his ear and calm him down well let's be clear too jets defense is not a pushover yeah they are that's a top a defense. defense in the league right now mm-hmm. and, and they're healthy finally like the last couple of years they've had all this talent and they haven't been healthy they're healthy now so this team with Aaron Rodgers would have been extremely tough to beat. Without yeah. Aaron Rodgers, you've got one of the top 10 defenses in the league, keeping them in the game, forcing turnovers. And I, I still think, I, I sent Glenn a note on this, I still think he was trying to keep his receivers happy and yeah. forcing plays that he just didn't need to force, right? Just a lot, mm. half of those could have been thrown away, live for another day, yeah. on it, or go, go, go for the next down. But I think he's trying too hard. And we've seen this with a lot of quarterbacks when – they're trying to keep their number one receivers happy as far as getting the ball, feeding the ball. When you force it, things fall apart. When you don't let things happen naturally and, you, and make the plays, things start to fall apart. And then you saw the stupid things like the fumble, whatever, like yeah, all the snap. There's just a lot of crap that went bad. Mm-hmm. Um, besides the punter's lack of tackling, there's a lot of things <laughs> that are just like, man, that probably won't happen again. <laughs> right? Like, it definitely is. If if I was a Bills fan, it is definitely not doom and gloom. If I'm a Jets fan, mm. I'm probably a little bit more frustrated because I was so amped up for this season, 
all I could think about was finally we've got one of the most legendary quarterbacks in the history of the NFL leading us away. We've got our young receiving core. We've got two great running backs. We've got a stud defensive uh, stud defense. We've got an okay offensive line. Should be just enough to keep us in this game. Three plays, four plays, whatever it was. And yes. That's just mm. – it's incredible. I felt, again, not a mm. Jets fan by any means. But I was excited to watch Aaron Rodgers play for them. I was excited yeah. to see them kind of turn the corner. Man, what a pit in your stomach just to be like, no, no, there's no way. Like, this this couldn't happen again. Um, it just – yeah, it was such it was such a nothing hit. Like he just kind of dragged him down, and his ankle just twisted. And the first he went down, and he, you know he never showed pain, never winced, never grabbed the ankle. He stood up, and then he shook his looked at the sideline. He shook his head, and then he went down. He went, and I almost thought it was like a heat cramp or something. You know, just just because it was so hot and humid um, in, in New York uh, on Monday. And but man, I'm with you. I was excited, and the Jets are in my division. I you know I want to beat them every time, but I was excited to see. How many times have we said this team's a quarterback away from winning a Super Bowl? That was that's exhibit A of a team that's quarterback away from winning a Super Bowl. I would have loved to see what he could have done with that team this year. Yeah, it's brutal. And I I also thought like how awful it must have been to be Robert Sala and just show up in your press conference and go, yeah. Yep. It's over. Like we, whatever he said, like, we're going to get the, the images back tomorrow, but I think we know what's up. Um, can that... like said, x-rays are negative. I'm like, what, what was this x-ray machine from like 1830? <laughs> <laughs> How do you not know immediately what that is? <laughs> the crazy part is they're, they're blaming the turf again. And I know that the, the unions already said they're pushing for grass fields all, all along, but I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I didn't see as, Foot get caught in the trip. Maybe, oh. maybe it happened so fast that you just couldn't see it. But yeah, that, that to me didn't seem like a turf injury. That just seemed you like you could see a, a catch man falling and twisting you over in a way that you're, mm. you know, how old is he? Forty years old, thirty nine years 39, old. Yeah. Your body just doesn't twist like it used to be. Yeah. You know, so it just it sucks. Mm. I mean, mm. I don't know, but I don't, I don't know if that was the turf one. They that mm. turf that they put in Giant Stadium, the players approved. Mm-hmm. management approved all the med- you know the medical staff approved they're supposed to be best of the best mm-hmm. so if that's not the case i don't know what it i mean it's also like to me the bottom line is there is no chance legitimately no chance that a natural grass surface would be better for I don't know, at least 10 of the 17 games of an NFL season in New York, New England, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, like any of these places that where you play outdoors and you're playing games in November and December, there is not a chance a natural grass field is better. It's just impossible. Like, and I know the NFLPA said, like, the research is on our side, I feel like when we were having this discussion last year, the research was kind of inconclusive. So I don't know what happened in the off season, but look like I I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine about the Yankees. Like a lot of stuff that happens in sports is luck. Like you throw a ball and it gets tipped and intercepted or it gets tipped and falls on the ground. Like a lot of that is luck. Um, A lot of injuries boil down to luck, that something is or isn't as severe as it turns out to be. And we always want to find an explanation. No, there needs to be someone to blame. There needs to be a throat to choke for why this turned out the way it did. No, maybe Aaron Rodgers is just a 39-year-old quarterback who had a weird freak way to tear his Achilles. Like, we're going to act like that doesn't happen? I, like, there doesn't have to be an explanation. Like, oh, if he hadn't been playing on turf. I, I don't know if I really buy that. I mean, I've played on those wet, saucy grass fields, and it is not good for your knees and your ankles and everything else. I mean, yeah. you're just you're slipping and sliding. There's not a cleat in the world that can save you from, you know, um, things getting caught underneath you and twists that shouldn't happen and what have you. And then when that freezes over, it's literally like playing on ice. So, I mean, I've been there, done that. Like, I get it. There's, there's something wrong with the turf last time because there's just way too many ACL injuries. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's also the way that 
these guys are working out now too. Maybe it's, you know, there's different things that they've got to be structured. So I don't remember, I mean, and maybe this is due to grass, but I don't remember back in the day, this many ACLs and MCLs getting torn every year. It is kind of a crazy thing, um, but they train differently, right? Mm-hmm. It was, it was just a different time, I guess. And there are different rules about where you can hit guys and how you can hit guys. And yeah. I mean, there are a million variables. Mm-hmm. You know, there's really bad luck. I mean, it was a rainy night. It was a rainy day. Um, and like you said, Craig, this this new turf is softer than usual of the other turfs. Um, I don't know if like just the combination of sliding and then digging into the softness. And then it just, you know, it was just a weird hit. Like it wasn't even a hit. He just kind of grabbed him by the waist and pulled him down. And, you know, when you saw that ankle buckle underneath, it was like, oh, geez. Just, I don't know, it just sucks. So the big <laughs> question is to everybody is where do they go? Right. Mm-hmm. I know I know they're putting on a brave face and saying Zach Wilson's our starter, but they gotta bring in a veteran, right? And there's some good veterans out there still. You got um uh Nick Foles, you've got, you know, Fitzpatrick, you've got Joe Flacco was saying he still got it. Did you Flacco, see that? Yeah, I mean you got Carson Wentz. So yep. there's oh, oh and Cam Newton's out there still. Um Colin Cap Colin Kaepernick is throwing his hat in the ring saying he wants to, you know, go through the interview process. So they've got people out there to choose from i think it's kind of crazy not to grab a veteran at this point um because i mean you'll still have aaron Rodgers being able to coach him up right it's not like he's going away but at the end of the day um there's going to be times where zach wilson just falls apart we saw it last year Mm -hmm. you know of all those quarterbacks who do you think they grab well i think the manning cast auditions gave us a little foreshadowing because they never got to tom brady and he said maybe i'll go back to football it's true. So I think uh, I wonder if he's getting a call. I, I know I guarantee he's getting a call. Yeah. I think the report today was the Jets aren't going near it. Really? Yeah. Which I don't know if I believe that, but that's yeah. at least something they're spreading. I I was seeing a little bit of Wentz buzz. Um, yeah. Maybe there's something there, but Matt Ryan coming out of the booth after his because he still wants to play. I think Matt Ryan still wants to play. And look with that defense, you know, you go with the 2000 Ravens model. You need a quarterback yeah. that throws for 180, 220. That's all you need with that defense. That's going to yeah. be in that running game. Yeah, you know, those backs. Reese Hall um, and Dalvin Cook. That's a one-two punch. Um, so th- they've got they've got weapons. They just need a serviceable quarterback that can get it to those good receivers and uh, hand it to those great running backs, and then let the defense take care of everything else. Team's not done. Not done. Speaking mm-hmm. of serviceable quarterbacks. Craig, are you prepared to talk about the Giants? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so, you know, we we asked on the last podcast if you had any message to the people who said that the Giants were bound to regress, they had a negative point differential last year, so many of their wins were in close games, you can't replicate that. And whether those people were right or wrong, I think I can't imagine too many people were expecting a 40 to nothing home loss right out of the gate. I, I I don't even know how you react to it. I think the weirdest part for me, and I'd love to get your take on this is it's not like they allowed a bunch of yards. No. Like they didn't put up a bunch of yards, but they allowed 265 yards of offense. They just managed to find a million different non-offensive ways for the Cowboys to score. So when you think about kind of how weird the game was, but also how anemic the offense looked, like how are you how are you triangulating all those things? So like you gotta you gotta break it up into buckets, right? So we gave up 21 points off of dumb errors, total giant misplays, blocked field goals. And and by the way, that drive, that that was going in for a touchdown. Dallas, had, mm-hmm. Dallas was on their heels. They had no idea what to do. We were just consistently getting six yards in a pop, you know, and then little dump off passes. It was, it was working. Then you get the offsides and you get the bad snap. And I get it. It's rain. It's pouring rain. It was downpouring that day, at the night. So I, I get it. But Dallas had to deal with the same element. So you can't really use that as an excuse. Um, but then the but to me, so take all that aside, and then they actually the defense actually did okay against Dallas. The two rookie quarterback uh, cornerbacks held up 
pretty well. I know, um, um, uh, what's his name got hurt, um, uh, on Hawkins Banks, I think his name is, but I, one of them got hurt with uh, with cramps. Um, but the the defense actually held up pretty well. To me, the most disappointing thing was there was zero pass rush. We never made Dak feel uncomfortable. So you take those 21 points aside, and they still would have won pretty easily by 14, right? Because we were inept in, one, getting to Dak, and making the big stop when we needed to. And that's where we really had a good focus. We picked up Isaiah Simmons. We picked up, um, oh, you got, you know, Thibodeau and Ojolari coming back healthy in, you know, their second and third year. You've got Dexter Lawrence with a massive contract this year. You got Barbara Okoro, uh, uh, who's the new middle linebacker, who's supposed to be an absolute stud. I get, so this is this was a lot to be excited about. At the end of the day, we couldn't stop them when we when we absolutely needed to for the big play to create a turnover or do whatever. And that kind of weather, you've got to be able to create turnovers. So that that part's all very frustrating. But the defense will get better. I I, I know they'll get better. They're 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 too good. And there's too much talent, and they're just getting used to this system. They'll be fine. The scariest part for me is one, the O line was so poor, especially on the right hand side, that they weren't just getting beat by Michael Parsons. They were getting beat by the third and fourth string, you know, run, uh, you know, pass rushers. They were just getting manhandled by basically anybody that got put in front of them. And you cannot win a game that way. Danny Jones was seeing ghosts before the ball was even snapped sometimes. So I get it. He missed some open throws, but he was probably concussed in the second quarter and so rattled that he just was, you know, running for his life and trying to force things. To me, the, the, Worst part of the whole thing was, um, you know, we didn't really get to see, and, and Dane Jones didn't play a great game. I don't want to, I don't want to be overly protective of him either because he did not play a great game. But um, at the end of the day, he he didn't have any time at all, and that's super frustrating because we've got three first round picks or three, you know, first and second round picks in the center and the two tackles now, uh, and the two tackles were both picked in the top five or top 10, I think. Um, the two guards were pretty big investments on the Giants' side um, last year, and both pretty well-respected guards, and they sucked. I mean, I, I could put one of my 11-year-old guards in that same spot and would have gotten the same result. It's just, it was that bad. And it was just, at the end of the day, um, I don't know how to fix that at this point, right? Like, there's there are some free agents out there that can pick up and shake things around, but man, how could they have not seen it throughout all of the off season, throughout the preseason that, you know, that these guys were this bad. And I, I get it during the, right, you know, during the preseason games, you're seeing vanilla defense, but man, how are we that off? Mm. You know, if, if we needed to move, you know, um, our, our tackle Evans into the, the guard spot, you know, that should have been done week one of preseason, get them used to it. Now. I don't know if you can, you can do that after week one of the regular season. Um, it's just you're now in desperation mode a little bit. So I'm not in pure panic that they're not going to get better and play better, have a better season. But man, is that offensive line absolutely dismal? Yeah, you know, it's so funny when you when you look at the stats on that game, they weren't that far off from each other except for sacks. You know, the yeah. Giants allowed seven sacks and Dallas didn't allow any. Other than that, like you know, um, Dak didn't play that much better than Daniel Jones. Uh, but that offensive line, uh, you know, getting kicks, you blocked kicks and, and, you know, the, the blocking on the line is just horrendous. Same with the bills. It's just horrendous. And it's such an important part of the game that I don't understand how these teams can overlook it, but I will say there was, there was one bright spot for the giants, Tyrod Taylor, two for two, six yards. Bill's legend. hundred percent passer rating, whatever. It was out of 140.7. <laughs> Cuba. Yeah. I Two for two for six yards might not know where we go get you to 158.3. <laughs> Start Tyrod week two. You'd have a perfect <laughs> game. Get a perfect game. Craig. At least we're going to Arizona. So if there's ever a yeah. team to actually try to have a comeback game with, Arizona's the one to do it. But I don't know. I, I, there's, I have zero confidence. I don't know if any Giants fans has any confidence that this offensive line will be able to stop, you know, a bunch of – 
you know, backups at this point. So, and our best tackle who actually still played pretty well has a hurt hamstring, Anthony Thomas, um, or Andrew Thomas, sorry, has a hamstring injury from trying to chase down one of the, uh, the block kick, kick, I think it was. So. Craig, what do you Oops. make of the rest of the division? Everyone won. Yeah. But Washington, I'm still not super worried about. I just think we're light years behind Dallas and the Eagles. Mm-hmm. And I do think Dallas will get a reckoning at some point. I still think the Eagles are better all around team. Eagles are, have a little bit of trouble tomorrow night because they have so many injuries. Um, but I still think they'll probably be able to squeak out a win. Um, Dallas will still implode. They're just destined for it. <laughs> How they operate. But I'll tell you what, that D-line is scary. Yeah, it sure is. Glenn, what about you? The people are really excited about the Dolphins offense. I saw that Tua's MVP odds went <laughs> uh, you know, way up uh after uh after his performance on Sunday. The Patriots, you know, to their credit, hung with the Eagles, I think, more mm-hmm. than people thought yeah. they would. The defense, I think, acquitted itself pretty nicely. They still can't move the ball. Um, or at least they can't move the ball like in the red zone. They're yeah. bad at scoring touchdowns. I think Mac may have thrown for like 350 yards or something, but you wouldn't have known it. Yeah. Uh how do you how do you handicap that competition, you know, with with Rogers out, with the performance that you saw from the Bills, with the Dolphins being, you know, kind of electric on offense? What do you what do you make of the landscape? Well, you know, you have to put the Dolphins at the top right now um, just because of that offense. But on the other side, they don't really have a good defense. Um, And I think the Bills are probably the only team now in the division that can keep up with them scoring wise. So I think they, you know, I'm not like, Craig, I'm not worried. I think the Bills, a lot of people were down on the Bills coming into this year. It was a weird night in in MetLife. uh, So I'm not worried. I think they're going to bounce back against uh, against Las Vegas this week. Um, But which is just a weird scheduling thing because I think that I still think the two best divisions in football are the AFC East and the NFC East. When by whatever happenstance they play each other this year, so yeah, they're gonna they're gonna inflict a lot of losses on each other, um, which is gonna be interesting down the playoff stretch to see who squeaks in. You know, it's you know usually when you have teams uh, divisions that strong, you know two or three teams can get into the playoffs. I don't think it's happening this year just because they're they're both playing each other. It's gonna be. Those are going to be tough games, tough matchups. But I'm not worried. I'm, I'm, I think the Bills bounce back. Uh, we've got, I think we have Vegas, and then we have Washington, and then we get, then we play uh, Miami, see where we are. That'll be a big one. Mm-hmm. I think it's time for us to talk about the newly highest paid player in the NFL <laughs> and the week one that he had. Joe Burrow, in a 24 to 3 loss in Cleveland, was 14 of 31 for 82 yards. And Normally, I feel like the narrative around Burrow is, well, his offensive line is so bad he gets sacked all the time. He only took two sacks on 31 dropbacks. So it can't be all that. He didn't throw a single interception. For all the talk about that offense and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd and Joe Mixon and Joe Burrow and all their weapons, they could not do anything against the Browns. Craig, any buyer's remorse, you think, on Cincinnati's part? Yeah, t- talk to Jack. Um, he drafted Burrow uh, oh, super man. early in fantasy football because um, he's a big fan. And I, I, it's crazy. I don't know. I mean, Burrow is great. He'll figure it out. Um, but it was, a, it was an interesting game to watch because I've never seen him look so inept, right? You still have all your offensive weapons there. And the O line didn't play great, but they didn't play horrible. It wasn't. It was just such a weird game. Um, and I, I don't know if 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 you had told me at halftime that was the highest paid quarterback in the league, you'd be like, no way. Uh, like if you didn't know who he was, you'd <laughs> say, who's this backup? You know, um, yeah. he must just be filling in for somebody because he didn't look like the Joe Burrow of old. Now he'll bounce back. He's just too good. I, I don't know how else to say it no one seemed super worried from the Cincinnati side but um it was definitely not a weekend for the big name quarterbacks mm-hmm. I think I think Mahomes looked okay not not typical 
out of this world Mahomes. I, you know, I get, I get it. Like, there was a lot of drop passes from his receivers there, but still, um, that was a very winnable game for Mahomes on most situations. Um, you had, uh, you know, Josh Allen had his struggles. Aaron Rodgers goes down. I mean, it was just one thing after that. Brock Purdy was basically the number one quarterback in the league this weekend and not even close. He was just awesome. Um, and I'm not saying you had some Dolphins fans who think you're erasing <laughs> Tua's performance. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Tua, Tua played pretty great. Uh, I got to give him credit. Um, but yeah, it's just, it was not a great quarterback weekend all around. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't think Burroughs got too much or Cincinnati fans have too much to worry about. He'll be back. Yeah. For some reason, Cleveland just has Cincinnati's number and, you know, you know, Miles Garrett, you know, if they put pressure on him, Burrow played terrible. I mean, like you said, it was a weird week. I'm just glad that Jamar Chase has given us the quote of the year so far. Do you see what he said after the game? He I said, did. I'm, just, I'm just frustrated because I called their ass elves and we just lost <laughs> to some elves. <laughs> I, I don't know how you beat that this year in the, yeah. in the quote. Post game, quotes. not going to. <laughs> you can't beat that. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> you're not gonna. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you gotta hang, hang that in a museum. That's just awesome. <laughs> so I think it's probably time to talk about Brock Purdy. You'll remember last year I was a total Brock Purdy denier. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a flash in the pan. He can't really be this good. You know, his last two years in college, and he was a four-year starter, so it's not like he lacked experience. He had 38 touchdowns and 17 interceptions. Like, he was addicted to throwing the ball to people who were not wearing his team's jersey. Like, he loved it. He would find extremely creative ways to do it. Like, you could make an hour-long compilation of Brock Purdy college lowlights. It was unbelievable. Like, people talk about good teams finding ways to win. At Iowa State, all Brock Purdy did was find ways to lose. And I was plugged into that. And now he's in the NFL. He's thrown, I think it's 15 touchdowns to four interceptions. He's suddenly, like very accurate he's completed like over two-thirds of his passes as an nfl quarterback obviously he plays in an offense that's full of weapons where he doesn't have to take crazy shots to make a difference but like holy cow like i this brock purdy i kind of wonder like did they just like replace brock college brock purdy with like a body double the way they did with avril levine um and like original Brock Purdy is like hidden somewhere. And this is a different guy that they get to pay. Like he was the last pick in the draft, but really he's some phenomenal quarterback. Like I have no idea where this came from, but good for him, man. Yeah. I mean, if you look at remember the, the last game of, of last year, the, the playoff game where he got hurt was the only game that he re really looked rattled before mm -hmm. even, even before he got hurt he was under so much pressure from the eagles that he was making bad judgment like the whole year he didn't look rattled he didn't make any bad calls he just was staying within himself and within the system and playing great and then then the eagles team rolled in and kind of beat the crap out of him and and uh you know he hurt his arm um but you know coming back this year you didn't know what you were going to get you hadn't really seen him since then it was it was he just a flash in the pan, but man, he looked awesome. Um, yeah. And you know now you know why they let Trey Lance go. Now, now you know why they have so much faith in him in the system. They just this kid's a real deal. You know, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how he comes around when he starts to get you know more pressure on him again. But he just seemed to be kind of gliding around on you know on Sunday and just hitting his spots, not really worried about anything else and happy he was you know making gestures after first downs it just you know he's starting to feel himself i think he's he's a, as legit as any quarterback in the league right now um especially after the weekend that we saw from some of these guys yeah this might be the most complete team now with aaron Rodgers going down you know you have a great defense great pass rush 
Christian McCaffrey. It's great to have Christian McCaffrey back there in the backfield. Helping. Looks like he's 20 years old again, doesn't he? McCaffrey. Yeah, he's like rejuvenated. But I don't know if it is Brock Purdy sort of a parallel to Josh Allen where, you know, he didn't maybe didn't have all the best coaching coming up and they saw some raw talent and they were able to work with him last year and, and work on mechanics and get him, you know, in decision making. Um, bad week to talk about Josh's decision making. <laughs> you know, it could be that, you know, there was a there was an interesting story in New York Times a couple of years ago about uh, specifically about high school athletes coming out of Fairfield, Connecticut, and how they have so much individual attention and coaching and the coaching so good and and the parents have money, so they're sending them the specialists that by the time they get to the college, they've hit their ceiling. Oh, so I think guys, so I think coaches now, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't want to call it the Josh Allen effect, but maybe it is. I think teams in, at all levels now are looking for raw talent that they can work with. Like that kid didn't have a quarterback's coach. We couldn't, the, his parents couldn't, didn't have money to send him a couple of times a week to work on mechanics and thought process with the next NFL player. Um, that happens in Fairfield County, Connecticut. And so there's a ceiling. And I think I think teams are starting to look at these kids with raw talent that they can work with and they can see that they the guys that haven't hit their ceiling and and they can sort of evaluate what that ceiling can be. And I think this, you know, maybe this that could be it. I don't know, but it's the only thing that I can explain how you make a jump like that. It's interesting that on that take, it used to be where if you didn't have it by the time you got to the pros and you were just kind of fine tuning things, you were out of the conversation, right? Cause they're like, we don't have time to teach you how to be a quarterback now because whatever, we'll teach you our offense. We'll teach you how to get the ball to certain spots and you know, how to make reads on defense, but that's it. You better know how to throw. You better have good footwork. You better have all these things because it is such like a win now league. Um, and maybe the, maybe that's taken a different direction again, especially with quarterback. I feel with like, there's only a few positions that you really have to like defense. You can almost, you know, if you're instinctive enough and aggressive enough, you'll figure out your position for the most part. Technique's always there and you'll get better as you go. Game slows down for you. But for the most part, you got it, right? You either got it or you don't. Um, but I think for receivers, running backs, and uh, cornerbacks, having that extra tutelage at that level with the high – you know, the high level coaching that you get in the NFL is so beneficial. It's tough to write those guys off early um, because you just never know. I want to shout out Brock Purdy's brother, Chubba Purdy, the backup yeah. quarterback at Nebraska. Um, he hasn't really done anything. He's sitting behind Jeff Sims, who has been terrible. Uh, I love Jeff Sims, though. Shout out special Jeff. Um, but man, Chubba Purdy, all time name, just an all time name. <laughs> Sounds like a candy. Like, oh yeah, I'm going down the candy store to get some <laughs> birdies. Exactly. <laughs> you want some? <laughs> exactly. And hey, he got into the game uh, last weekend against Colorado. We'll see if he uh, sees any more action. Um, I got to shout myself out a little bit here. Um, <laughs> I, I told everyone, watch out for Zay Flowers. And then, if people were watching out for Zay Flowers. What they saw is that he led the Ravens in targets, receptions, and receiving yards. Uh, he accounted for 78 of Lamar's 169 passing yards in a kind of like weird, underwhelming, but never in doubt performance against the Texans. Um, you know, I'm not always the guy who's out here going to bat for Boston College, the historic little brother of my preferred institution. But uh, Zay Flowers, a BC product, really delivered for, uh, you know, the hometown team and my fantasy team as well this weekend. And I felt very vindicated watching him do it. So just had to get that in there, uh, taking a little victory lap on the Zay Flowers take. Yeah, it looked like a stud. I mean, I, I think Odell had what, you know, three or four catches back two catches on three targets so i mean you know looks like flowers is the mm -hmm. the target of choice for lamar right now um but oh, i wonder I wonder if that pisses odell off or if you know well, odell's that. already disgruntled i guarantee it yeah you think yeah only three targets did, did he get hurt did he come out of the game and I, I thought i heard that he twisted his ankle or something but he um, may, back in. he may have but uh three targets tied him for second on the team yeah like L lamar attempted 22 passes Ooh. 10 of them went in the direction of zay flowers <laughs> and i think like part of what we're seeing here is i think he only targeted tight ends twice 
And Isaiah likely is kind of like a combo guy. So had Mark Andrews been playing, I think that shakes out differently. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> if you're Odell and you're expecting to get a bunch of targets, you can't be too pleased. And of course that was another game with a terrible season ending injury as JK Dobbins went down and is going to miss an entire season again. You got to feel bad for that guy. He's like the Will Zalatoris of football. <laughs> He can't putt. <laughs> he can't putt. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. A short game start. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> it looked like Lamar had another serviceable game. Yeah, he was. He was fine. He he threw a pick, but he was generally accurate. Made a little bit of a difference on the ground. I think they're like, I don't know what they're gonna do at running back with. Dobbins gone, but um, because I I do think that there's going to be a commitment to keeping Lamar as like not the centerpiece of the running game, especially mm -hmm. after giving him all that money. And I don't I don't think today they have a great strategy for how they're going to do that because he was the only guy who was really productive, getting productive touches in the running game. So they're going yeah. to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I don't think a whole lot of teams separated themselves this weekend. I think, Definitely you know, not. maybe showed that they're competitive, but I think that whole division is going to be pretty competitive this year. Um, Dallas obviously played great, but that's, let's see if they can continue to go down that route. I think um, to Glenn's point, you know, you've got Seattle didn't look great, but you've got the, um, um, I think the 49ers right now look like the one team that, came in and hasn't missed a step from last year and just kind of ready to rock. So, um, I mean, even the Dolphins, in two weeks. even the Dolphins, like they, sure, they put up a ton of points, but they also showed that you can kind of score at will against them. Yeah. Like, it was a late drive fueled by their very explosive offense, of course, but like it was a late drive that got them the win there and they mm -hmm. had given up, what, 34 points in 56 minutes prior to that or something like and justin herbert did not have like a great justin herbert game um the main problem was they let eckler and company run all over them like holy cow could they not stop the run um like that i think that's if i were a dolphins fan that's what i'd be concerned about is you can get in all these track meets but like, if it's just last team to have the ball wins, it's a coin flip as to whether you're going to win or not. Yeah. At what point does San, well, LA, the, the Chargers start thinking about getting rid of that coach? I just think he's he's had so many big games and so many losses and just kind of some questionable decisions going for it at the end of the game, not going for it. Um, at some point, um, I don't know, I'd look at him with all, there's another team. That team's got a ton of talent. It sh they should be They've been underperforming since Herbert got there. Herbert's great. Yeah, I think I think you can make an argument that it would be tough to do less than Staley has with the guys he's had. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. I mean that that his best season is ten and seven. Again, it's only year three for him. Mm -hmm. There was a modest improvement over the prior year, but like the idea that like this is this is what they're getting out of that roster, I agree. It strikes me as, hey, do you need to kind of take a look at this? Yeah. After blowing that game last year in Jackson against Jacksonville, it's like yeah. you gotta start looking at this guy. I mean, you said it's only three years, but I I think he's a coach that as of now is on the hot seat, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean that that playoff game was unforgivable. To get out scored 24 to 3 in the second half with all the talent you have on offense. Yep. And like their defense was serviceable last year. It wasn't like worst in the league. That was yeah. that was really bad. And yeah. then you know, you come out and obviously they didn't blow quite that much of a lead against the Dolphins, but to have the lead lead late and yeah. give it right up, mm -hmm. it's not the start you want to get off to. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. 
yeah, so a lo- lot of season left. Mm-hmm. We'll see how it goes, but man, it's uh, the storylines have been laid, and it'll be fun to follow. <laughs> uh, obviously, on the PGA Tour front, we have the final fall season. Um, I don't know like what's going to happen to autumn, the institution, the part of the year without eight minor golf tournaments happening during it, but mm-hmm. um, I guess we'll find out next year. Uh, but we've got the Fortinet, the first of that fall series this week. Max Homa is almost guaranteed to win it as he's won it the last two years, and that's how I understand those things to work. Um, it does sound like, and maybe this is just post Ryder Cup, there could be some solid fields this fall just because of the way the incentives work for being able to improve your FedEx Cup standings after the fact to either make sure you secure your card or play your way into some of the designated events. So we could be seeing some big names who didn't advance very far in the FedEx Cup making a little bit of a splash this fall. But I got to say, even with like a pretty underwhelming weekend of college football coming up, with the NFL back, and with college football in full swing, it's going to be hard for the PGA Tour to convince me that I should be watching anything basically <laughs> until and except the Ryder Cup. And I'd be surprised if you guys feel differently. No, I'll watch more footage of the Koskov Crushers, uh, the team we <laughs> play this Sunday, um, than I will of uh, any golf this weekend, put it that way. Craig, are you, I, the serious question, are you doing film study for 11-year-old football? Yeah, 100%. Actually? Yeah. Whoa. Yep. It, so is anyone, I'm this. I'm like fascinated by this. Is anyone doing something weird? Like, is there a team that never punts? Is there a team that's running the triple option? Or like, is everyone basically running the same playbook and you just see what they like? No, it's, so the, the way they have it set up, everyone's got access to everyone's, uh, it's, it's like a team wide, it's called, you know, um, a huddle. Everyone's got access to yeah. everyone's games. And it's more of just, getting used to you know um their strengths and weaknesses i don't i don't break it down to how many run plays they do i don't look for tendencies i don't look for any of that stuff i know some coaches do for me it's just more about if i'm going to put my defense in there um what do i need to make sure i have covered and get the kids prepared well enough so they can you know go out and have a good game um but i watch more we just haven't played yet i'll Mm -hmm. watch more of our games than i will of the opponents because you never know. Most of these other teams have, you know, two or three kids that are absolute studs and the rest are just kind of holding everything together. So you just focus on those, on those players. But for me, it's, I'm a better coach watching them after the fact to say, okay, great. We meant to go this way and two kids spaced out and went the other way and it'll cause a massive hole to open up and the running back basically skipped through and got a touchdown. I got to address that with the team. I got to figure out you know, who's not paying attention, who's doing what, who's helping us, who's hurting us, who's hustling, who's not, all these things. So um, that's what that's what I usually look out, look for. But we just have, we had a bye the first week. So I'm just <laughs> taking advantage of that and watching. My favorite play that I saw this week was um, a dog running on the field. Because um, <laughs> the kid who owned the dog was on the field at a point, and all of a sudden you're watching this run play and the, everything gets kind of piled up and you see this, labradoodle go running across and I'm like, what, what was that so i stopped and went back and watched it yeah well, sure enough. and then you watch the end of the play and it comes back into the huddle and the ref has to grab it and then the mom comes up. so yeah. you just wanted to be air bud yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. I, was, I don't know how to stop that i don't know um are you practicing the annexation of puerto rico not yet but i'm a defensive coach glenn i don't yeah. i don't care what they run on the offense <laughs> Oh, point. I had so many suggestions. I was going to say you should run Philly special. I was going to say you should install the triple option. Just run like the 1988 Notre Dame playbook. Um, it worked for them. Uh, I was going to say that you should do the, um, the, the thing that Bill Belichick used to do where he would mess with which guys were on the line of scrimmage versus not to mess with who's eligible. Um, so then they'd have like an unbalanced line 
and a tight end would be ineligible because he's covering up the tackle and then the tackles eligible. Like they, they threw a touchdown to Nate Solder in the AFC championship one year doing that. Like you gotta, you gotta mess with that stuff. Everybody does that. It's, yeah. Everybody does that. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I think you should blitz on every down, send the house and just steamroll everybody. I'm telling all the kids to make sure they wear the same colored gloves that they have as Jersey. So it's harder to tell holding. Um, that's yes. Oh yeah. They were talking about that on the, the Kelsey yeah. podcast, right? Yeah, Kelly Elliman was talking about that. Yeah, the you red gloves. Red gloves and you get in trouble because it was like a, <laughs> wearing a big red flag every time he grabbed the his pads. <laughs> and he kept getting penalties and Belichick would just say to him, you had to do it, right? You got to be doing it. You can't wear the white gloves like everybody else. Like this. That's yeah. awesome. All right, Craig, as we get things wrapped up here, what do people got to know about what we're up to here at One Club Short? Yeah, so we got our last event coming up um, at uh, Morris County Golf Club. It is uh, it's going to be such a cool way to end our, our season. Um, it's a great golf course. It's really easy to get to from everyone in the tri-state area. Um, and it is, it's very highly, highly regarded. It is the same format that we've done before. It's, for, it's a foursome. Uh, better ball of the group net and gross. We've got some great prizes already lined up. Um, some of it you can actually see online at the at the, our Shopify shop because we're selling some of the, the stuff as well. But um, we've got a couple spots left. It's what's it, two and a half weeks away. So it's October yeah. 3rd, which is a Tuesday. I know we usually do Monday, but this is a Tuesday. So, um, you know, we'd love to see you all. It'd be a great way to kind of end your golf season as we head into a little bit of fall ball. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's, uh, this was the, this was one of the ones that I hadn't had a chance to really play or know much about when we initially started looking at it. And I am, uh, I'm super psyched. We got it. So it is going to be a awesome send off of the year. Can't wait. Glenn, any parting shots from you before we wrap up here? Well, I just saw that, uh, Dave Portnoy put a $10,000 bet on your boy Hartman to win the Heisman. I love that. So. That's a good sign. I don't think that guy loses often. So, yeah, no. <laughs> and I think uh, Bills, Chiefs, Bengals, everybody bounces back this week. Life Our returns team. to normal. Uh, Craig, can you negotiate to get my boy Jalen Hyatt some more targets this coming week? He only had one. That's, uh, you know, it's crazy to have all these awesome new weapons and not be able to throw them the ball. <laughs> like, <it's> like, <laughs> got Saquon healthy you've got you know one of the top two tight ends in the league you've got all these fast receivers that can catch the ball and do whatever they're getting open just got to get on the ball he needs that one extra second give him one more second offensive line yeah. he might just need to be playing in normal weather that's what I'm gonna go yeah, it's also, yeah it was a crap but line. Danny Jones needs to pull the trigger too like he's he so I think he's still so hesitant with some of these things too. Just trust yourself, get it out there, have a little bit of Josh Allen, and you know who cares if you get the turnover sometimes. But you gotta; these guys can all make plays. Get them the ball. Yeah, preach. All right. So as we wrap up here, you can keep up with us at OneClubShort.com for everything you want to know about the upcoming Morris County event. You can follow us on Instagram. We're at OneClubShort. We're very active on there, especially if you want to see some of that merch that Craig was talking about. A lot of that has been going up on the Instagram story. Looks awesome. So you can follow us there. On Twitter, we are at One Club Short and then the number one. Podcasts are available wherever you get your podcasts. If you're listening on Spotify, you'll get video. And the videos also go up on our YouTube, which is at One Club Short Pod. That wraps it up for this episode. We'll be back same time, same place next week to do it again. Until then, thanks everyone for listening. Peace.